evening. Yeah, Welcome. Uh, thanks for coming out for another installment of Rare Music. I'm Aaron Wellborn. I'm the Director of Communications for the Libraries, and we're delighted you could come out on this chilly December afternoon. We have a great program for you. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to say a few words about our sponsors. Uh, Rare Music, this series, is a partnership that's been going on for about five years now between the libraries and the Duke University Musical Instrument Collections. But we get additional support from the Vice Provost for the Arts, the Carabina Endowment, Friends of Dumick, High Strung Violins and Guitars, Ruggiero Piano, and Vocor Incorporated. So if you enjoy our programs, I hope you'll please tell our sponsors and thank them too. Uh, one little bit of housekeeping. If you have one of these or something that makes noise, now might be a good time to go ahead and turn that off. Uh, and uh, that's all I have to say. I'm going to hand things over now to Brenda Scott, who's the curator of the Duke Musical Instrument Collections, and she'll introduce our guest. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Erin. So this is just uh, wonderful to see all of you here today, especially with the uh, interesting parking. And as I said in an email to you, I wish we had our own dedicated rare music parking lot, but we don't. Um, just really quickly, we have a great lineup for next, uh, next semester's rare music, and we're having a couple of events actually over at Dumic as well as the regular events here, so do watch your email for those. And at this time, I'm, I want to also thank a couple of volunteers I have. Uh, you, you've seen them at a lot of rare musics. Uh, particularly Jennifer Morgan. I don't think she's missed one since she's she's come to Duke as a student. She's at the back, so if you see her, you know, say thank you. That'd be great. And I have a fairly new volunteer, and that is Adam Della Majora, and he is putting a lot of rare musics on YouTube. So you'll get an email from me with links coming very soon. All right. At this time, I'm very excited to introduce Professor Dewey Lawson, who's an adjunct professor of physics, and I'm very excited about hearing his program today. Here's Professor Lawson. Thank you. I'd also just like to acknowledge uh, Brenda's many contributions, too. I, my, my students in my acoustics and music course have uh, benefited greatly from her organizing and making available uh, and explaining the, uh, the Duke Musical, Musical Instrument Collection, which is, if you don't know about it, you should find out about it, because one of the unique things about it is not just instruments to be looked at, but it's instruments to be used, and students can actually get their hands on instruments if they have a good motivation for doing that, and can uh, really, uh, it's a wonderful adjunct to uh, academic instruction in a lot of areas, in including the acoustics uh, that I teach. <coughs> uh, what I'd like to do today is to try to give you a, some insight into ways in which uh, an understanding of physics can be useful in one aspect of music. Uh, we, in acoustics and music, we look at uh, the, the attributes of human hearing, because only what people can hear matters musically. Uh, we also look at the acoustical properties of musical instruments of various sorts, understanding, uh, delving the, the extent to which we understand the way they function today. And uh, in many cases, we're still sort of groping to better understand some of the subtleties of musical instruments. And, and we, then, of course, room acoustics, uh, which are a, is a large, uh, what people normally assume we're talking about when we talk about musical acoustics, the acoustics of rooms. Uh, and we'll actually be aware of this room. Uh, it's, it's a room that acoustically we would refer to as being rather dead because there's really virtually no reverberation in here at all. I'll show you a curve in a minute for uh, the reverberation time of this room when it's empty. And of course now with all of you here, each of you is contributing your bit of sound absorption and making it an even deader room. Um, but uh, we'll look at, at make, make some, sorry, there was no pejorative thing. <laughs> uh, I'm on my feet, so I'll stay awake. Um, but uh, one of the nice things about this room is that uh, later on in, at the end of the, uh, the session today, I'll be playing some recordings that are based on a, a really wonderful recording that, that uh, Bookard did uh, of a performance here last March uh, that we're going to process in ways to let you hear what uh, that, that performance would have sounded like in a room that hasn't existed since the mid-19th century, a room that's of great interest to musicologists. And so we'll try to recreate that for you and, and uh, reproduce it. But uh, th there's really three sections to what I want to talk about today. Uh, the first one is about what a wonderful laboratory Duke Chapel is for a number of things having to do with music and acoustics. 
Uh, the second part will be to show you some wonderful research that's been done very recently in Venice, uh, trying to better understand uh, some things having to do with the development of coral polyphony in Renaissance Venice uh, by connecting it with uh, the acoustical properties of the rooms that were available, the churches that were available there, uh, and looking at some of the performance arrangements, uh, that is, locations of performers uh, that have been discussed as possibilities uh, based on what information is available to musicologists. But I want to start with, the, and then the third thing will be this recreation of a 19th century room. Uh, Duke Chapel is a wonderful laboratory for performance practice. Uh, we have incredible organs in there that our organ students can, can actually experience the kind of acoustic conditions that many composers, for instance, Jazz Bach or Buxtehude, would have had in mind for their compositions and know what they would sound like in those kinds of acoustical conditions even if they will spend the rest of their careers playing in very different kinds of acoustical environments, they will know from this experience, and they'll learn how the acoustics of the room influence performance practice, and we'll see a, a few words about that. Duke Chapel is a beautiful example of, of Gothic architecture. Uh, many people, when they look at the chapel, are immediately suspicious uh, because the, uh, uh, the buttresses are so modest in size, and they immediately suspect that there is a steel frame to this building. There's not. It is an architecturally honest, masonry-supported uh, building. Uh, the reason that the buttresses can be so modest, there are two reasons. One is that building codes require there to be steel trusses in supporting the roof rather than any more traditional Gothic arrangement. So there's less outward force as a result of that that has to be borne by, uh, by buttresses. And the, uh, and the, uh, the vaulting between the, the stone ribs of the vaulting the vaulting is actually not stone the way what it appears to be, but is a much less heavy material, less, less dense material called acoustolith, which is a porous ceramic material produced uh, specifically to reduce reverberation time in large, uh, large buildings, large rooms. A company in New Jersey, Westavino, produced this, and it was used a lot in government buildings and banks. The Boston Public Library is, is filled with this stuff, and Duke Chapel was lined with it above about seven feet on the walls and, and all of the uh, vaulting was originally a acoustolith, which was highly absorbent. It was porous, so that air uh, waves moving into it uh, would create friction and would dissipate a lot of their energy. And so originally, when Duke Chapel was first built, the reverberation time in there was a maximum of only about two and a half seconds. It was a very different room than it is now. When the university decided to commission a wonderful flintrop organ, which is the organ that's at the rear of the chapel, uh, Dirk Flintrop, the head of that shop, uh, visited Duke and was considering the, the commission, but said that he would not accept the commission unless the room were made to sound as good as it looked. And so the university commissioned an, architect, uh, an acoustical firm, Bolt, Bryan, and Newman in Cambridge, Massachusetts, to come up with a treatment that could be applied to that acoustic surface to seal up the pores and to, uh, to restore the reverberation uh, or to make the reverberation as long as would have been characteristic of a room that looked like that, one that would be historically more accurate for such a Gothic structure. And they came up with a material which is rather like beeswax, which could be sprayed or brushed onto the stone, which did not have any, cause any of the objectionable change in the appearance of the stone. You can actually see it if you go into Duke Chapel and look at the side walls, uh, <laughs> where there are large flat walls on the sides in, in, uh, in the passageways, and you can see a color change at about seven feet. Everything below that is actually stone, and everything above that is actually acoustolith that's been treated. And that was done in two, in two stages in order to achieve the present conditions, which are reverberation times that are as up around five and a half seconds at some frequencies. Here are a couple of architectural drawings of the chapel. Uh, the, the steel trusses that are up here supporting the roof are one of the reasons that the, 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 uh, uh, the buttresses can be so, so modest. It's a wonderful space up there if you ever get a chance to visit. There is an attic to Duke Chapel. Um, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a little ramp that goes up over the crossing. Um, and of course, the, there's the, the Caroline up here. And the, the main space, the actual space that's acoustically connected in the chapel uh, is outlined in, in blue here uh, at the bottom. And sometimes people assume if they, if they have a crying baby or getting a cell phone call that they can go out into the narthex, they're in a different room. Uh, they're wrong because <laughs> the only thing between the narthex and the nave is the organ, which does not go all the way to the ceiling. So members of the organ faculty routinely have to go out and take the elbow of someone who's taken a baby or a cell phone out, out into the narthex and, and usher them out of the building so that everyone else can enjoy the music. Uh, 
in a room like the chapel, it's, it's a wonderful uh, physics laboratory as well because it gives us a wonderful way of understanding some of the distinctions we like to make acoustically. And I'll submit to you that there are interactions in a room like this uh, among a variety of different kinds of fields that we don't tend to think of as being together. Architecture, obviously. We can all go in and look at and appreciate the architecture. And of course, there's the, uh, the visual program of decisions as to what, uh, what religious themes are depicted in the stained glass windows and the carvings and so forth. Uh, the acoustics, of course, is something that's important to me and we'll be saying more about and giving lots of examples of. The liturgy, the actual religious rites that are performed in the building interact very strongly with the structure of the building itself and with the acoustics. Um, compositions of music for these spaces are influenced by anticipation of what the properties of the spaces are like. Where can you put performing groups? Uh, what kind of acoustics do you have? Uh, will things be clear? Can you have intricate, rapid lyrics? Uh, or is that going to be very difficult to achieve in a particular space? Uh, the choice of different locations for the sound sources, and by sound sources I mean organs and singers typically, and people trying to speak and be understood. Uh, one of the things that happened in Duke Chapel when the reverberation time was increased uh, to, to, to satisfy uh, Dirk Flintrop for the organ, uh, it made it glorious for a large part of the organ literature. It made it very challenging for speech reception. <laughs> and so uh, it, it would not have been a conceivable thing to do before we reached a stage in the, in the development of technology that allowed us to have a relatively sophisticated sound reinforcement system so that we could maintain speech intelligibility uh, through electronic means in a very reverberant space like that. Also, performance practice is influenced uh, is a related thing here. And th the organ students I mentioned, if you're performing on an organ in the chapel, the length of pauses, the length of rests, even the length of individual notes will all be influenced by the acoustical environment. And people who perform there regularly get to be masters of knowing what things are going to sound like. If you're sitting at the organ, at the Flintrop organ, you have a very poor idea from what you hear as to what you sound like. But if you've listened to lots of other people performing there, you can develop a, an expert knowledge, which our, our organists like Art Parkins and David Arcus certainly have, um, knowing what things are sounding like. And they can adjust the timing, the phrasing, the length of, of silences between things to allow the reverberation to decay a certain amount before you introduce another note. You can't have any immediate changes, instantaneous changes, if you change from one chord to another suddenly. Uh, not everything changes instantaneously. There's a long reverberation of the initial chord that gradually fades away. This can be used artistically to great effect. You can have this, there can be a wonderful uh, 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 transition that can occur there. The other thing is that when you play a note, you don't get the maximum loudness from it instantaneously because some of the sound comes directly to you, you hear that, but the reverberation, just as it dies away slowly, it also builds up slowly in the chapel. So if you play a, a full chord, say at the, at the climax of a large orchestral work, uh, or a large organ work, just reading that way, uh, actually, actually it, will, it will gain in richness and, and fill itself out over the next several seconds as the reverberant sound field builds up in the chapel. So I encourage you to listen to this next time you're in the chapel. Uh, so type organ design, design is influenced by all of these other things as well. And in fact, that the Flintrop organ was designed specifically for that space and was in fact voiced in that space. It was assembled in Zandam Holland, brought to, to Duke, uh, put up there, and a uh, very talented organ voicer from the Flintrop shop spent several months in the chapel doing the initial voicing, adjustment of every individual pipe so that uh, it would, would be well adapted to the acoustical part of the conditions of the room. <coughs> so all of this stuff is related. Everything from pipe voicing to composition to performance practice uh, style, you might say, of the performance, to where you locate your various uh, sound sources, whether they be choral or, 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 or a speaker or an organ or an orchestra. Uh, now, having said that, I'd like to, to introduce you to a little bit of basic physics because it's really crucial to moving beyond just stating that, they, that these things are important to giving you some insight into why the chapel is a wonderful space for particular kinds of music, particularly oral, early choral work, uh, like uh, a particular plain song, the Gregorian chant, uh, where it's possible to convey a text in a highly reverberant space in a way that you could never do with speech because of the confusion of the reverberation. 
uh, Gregorian chant evolved in uh, spaces that are very much like this, uh, that, that are uh, these sort of Gothic spaces that have um, lo relatively long reverberation times. And early organ music of, of J.S. Bach and uh, of earlier as well, Lux de Vida. Um, the range of sound and frequency and pitch is enormous. Uh, we can hear frequencies that go from 20 cycles per second, 20 hertz uh, is the technology we normally use in physics, up to 20,000 cycles per second, a factor of 1,000 in frequency. We also architecturally want to be aware of the wavelength of, this, of those sounds in air. And the wavelength of the sound is just the distance that the sound travels in one cycle. So for 20 cycles per second, since sound moves at slightly more than 1,000 feet per second under typical room conditions, uh, the wavelength of 20, 20 cycle sound, the lowest sounds that human beings can normally hear, is about 55 feet. Very, very large. Uh, large in comparison to this room. At the other end, 20,000 cycles per second, the highest frequencies that a healthy young adult can hear, uh, is about two thirds of an inch. So we're talking about from less than an inch up to 55 feet in the wavelength. <laughs> Enormous range. And uh, all of our architectural structures are sort of somewhere in there, overlaid against that, that range. When sound reaches a boundary of a room, a wall, a ceiling, a floor, a person, some of the sound is going to be absorbed and some will be reflected. Now how much is absorbed depends on the nature of the materials. We've already talked about a porous material will absorb sound, your, your clothing will tend to absorb sound. Uh, uh, various materials have various characteristics, absorb more in certain frequency ranges than others. That gets to be a fairly complicated issue. We'll refer back to that later on uh, today, but we won't get into that right now. But let's focus our attention on the part of the sound that's reflected every time it, some sound reaches a boundary. And we need to say more than just that it's reflected. Imagine two situations using a visual comparison, because everything that's true of light waves is also true of sound waves. You, you know something about one, you know something about the other. Imagine a mirror, first of all, a, a perfect mirror. Everything is reflected. All light that strikes it is reflected from it. Now imagine a very white wall, a wall that's so white that it also reflects all of the light that reaches it. But there's no image. The mirror reflects in a way that we call specular reflection, that it preserves an image, whereas the white wall reflects diffusively. It still sends all of the light out, or in the case of acoustics, all the sound, but it sends it in various directions, not well-defined directions, that preserve an image. The difference between those two cases is the smoothness of the surface compared to the wavelength of whatever the waves are. In the case of light, the mirror is, is smooth on the scale of the wavelengths of light. In a room, a, a surface that reflects specularly is smooth on the scale <coughs> of the wavelengths of sound. So a particular surface in a room may reflect some wavelengths, some frequencies, specularly and others diffusively. One good example is imagine a grand staircase somewhere. If that staircase for low frequency sounds that have wavelengths that are tens of feet, it just looks like a diagonal mirror. It will specularly reflect an image up because it's just a diagonal mirror. But at high frequencies, for wavelengths that are less than an inch, it's an array of vertical mirrors that's going to reflect the sound back with various delays because of the offsets of the, of the steps back in the direction from which it came. So the behavior of a surface can be very different at different frequencies, different pitches, because of the interaction of wavelengths with the structure of the, <coughs> of the border of the room. So specular reflection for smooth surfaces compared to the wavelength, diffuse reflection for rough surfaces. An image is pre preserved in the case of the specular reflections, no image is preserved in the case of the diffuse reflections. And in the case of the specular reflections, we have the possibility of a frank echo. Now, the word echo is used informally by people in, in lots of different ways, uh, including many people will go into Duke Chapel and say, oh, it has a terrible echo. Well, acousticians would not say that's an echo at all because you don't hear an image of the sound you hear a nice smooth reverberation. And it's because the, the echo we think of as being an event, a replay of an event that we can recognize as a separate repeated event. Um, whereas reverberation may be very intense, but it dies off smoothly. And ideally it dies off very smoothly the same way at all frequency ranges. 
Now, one other bit of physics uh, in psychology I want to introduce here is something called the association time, which is really important for musical performance in acoustical spaces. If we hear an image of a sound that arrives after the initial sound, that is an echo, but if it occurs soon enough after the initial sound, we will associate it in our brains and only hear it as a single sound. Now that association time extends out at least to 35 milliseconds, 0.035 seconds, but may extend as far out as 50 milliseconds in some cases, and it depends on the nature of the sound. A trumpet note, for instance, uh, a 50 millisecond delay, you won't hear it as being two trumpet notes. A snare drum beat, however, with a 50 millisecond delay, you will hear two snare drum beats. It's because of the, 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 uh, the, 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 the punctual nature of the, of the snare drum sound. So it's really important if we're going to allow any specular reflection, any <coughs> echoes to be added to the music we're making, that we, we be sure that they arrive to the audience within the association time, so they're not heard as separate events that could be confusing. If you're reinforcing, reinforcing speech electronically, you want to be sure that the sound from your loudspeaker arrives at the listener soon after the direct sound does, but less than the association time afterwards, so that you, it's all, all associated, you hear it as, as in, 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 intensifying the sound and clarifying it. So if you go to something in Page Auditorium, a piano performance in Page Auditorium, you'll notice that the the people there who are very experienced at this have set up reflecting panels that are only 10 or 15 feet behind the piano. That means at a, a thousand feet per second, that's about a foot per millisecond, that means that the sound of the piano, some of it comes right out to the audience, some of it goes upstage to that reflecting panel and is reflected off. If it goes 15 feet up, 15 feet back, it's only delayed by 30 milliseconds and will arrive in the audience within the association time and will actually help with your appreciation of the structure of the music. If you didn't have those panels there, the sound would go back to the masonry wall up at the stage end of the Page Auditorium, which is a lot further than that away, and you would be aware in many seats of a definite echo coming after each note. Now, in Duke Chapel, if you look in practically any direction at all in the chapel, you'll see surfaces that are rough over the entire range of, of the spectrum of sound. And that's a wonderful gift of high Gothic architecture. Because for the highest pitch sounds, that is the shortest wavelengths, so an inch or less, uh, all of these large columns are made up of these convex surfaces that will tend to scatter that sound a bit. So you don't have any really flat reflecting surfaces that are going to send back echoes. And as you get larger and larger, because each column is composed compoundly of, of these cylindrical sections, this surface is rough on the scale of a foot, of two feet, of three feet, of 10 feet, of 20 feet. Uh, the chapel is a wonderful diffusive scatterer of sound over the entire audible spectrum. You see that if you look at the fans, uh, where the ribs of the columns go up and spread out into the, into the vaulting. Um, we're getting an advertisement here. Um, <laughs> I, I, I should have turned off my wine box. Uh, and even up in the, in the ceiling, uh, in, the, in the vaulting, uh, there's a lot of structure up in there that provides a lot of diffuse reflection, which is very, very helpful. As a result of that, if we go in and fire a storage pistol in Duke Chapel, which I have done, um, this is a recording, an individual recording of, at a particular frequency of the firing of a single storage pistol shot in Duke Chapel in the nave and recording it in the nave and you get a wonderful straight line. This is, is, is a level in decibels. Uh, reverberation time is defined as being the time required for the level of the sound to decrease by 60 decibels. So that's three of these horizontal divisions, and you get this really wonderfully straight line here uh, so that this, this is a very smooth reverberation, sort of the ideal that you would like to achieve. Let me play you some examples of sounds that are that are really well suited to the, to the acoustic environment of Duke Chapel. First, a recording of some chant by the Duke Vespers Ensemble that performs every Thursday afternoon at Vespers at Duke, uh, directed uh, by Alan Friedman. Listen for the reverberation. Oh, oh, oh. 
tell, I think, that if you can convey the liturgical text in something like that very clearly, even in a highly reverberant space, much more clearly than you could if someone were trying to read that text. I know that probably most of you don't speak Latin, but it, it, is, it, is a very, uh, it's, it can be very clearly communicated by a well-trained uh, group, a, ch a chanting group. Another example of the kind of music that is ideally, uh, that, that for which the chapel is ideally suited in acoustical terms, is uh, much of the organ, famous organ repertoire. And I've got an example here from Jazz Bach. This is a performance on the flint drop organ at the rear of the chapel by Robert Parkins, university organist. particularly about gaps between notes. Some of them are rather brief, some of them are quite long. And in many of those cases, he's doing that to, to maximize the clarity of what he's playing in view of the acoustical properties of the room in which he's performing. If you were to perform that in a much drier room, then the timing of a lot of those decisions would be quite different. And in fact, even the length of individual notes, uh, whether you play something staccato or marcato, uh, can have an enormous effect on how well you can pick out an inner voice. And the organ itself, in the case of the flint drop, was voiced for that space. It's on a raised platform at the rear of the sanctuary, so, of the nave, so that it's not too close to the people who are right in front of it, and so that there are direct lines from the pipes of the organ to all to the heads of all the people sitting at the length of the nave. If you're in the transepts, you're at a disadvantage. But if you're anywhere on the nave, you get some direct sound coming directly from that organ. And the uh, organ is only, almost all that organ is at most four and a half feet deep so that every pipe in that organ speaks directly into the space. It's in great contrast to the other large organ in the chapel, the Aeolian, where the pipes are in very large chambers with relatively modest openings between those chambers in the room. It's a different style of organ with different sorts of objectives, and a, a style of organ that really uh, generally not used in spaces as reverberant as this, as a rule. Now, I've, I've shown you this beautiful, uh, smooth decay pattern for uh, reverberation in the chapel in the nave. I've got another one here. For, for many years, I had heard from the organists and from the choral directors in the chapel that they felt that the acoustics were a little bit drier, that is the reverberation not as long, in the choir. And so we decided to investigate this. Uh, several students of mine and I investigated it. And this is an example of a starter's pistol shot fired in the choir and recorded from a microphone in the choir. If you apply the definition of a reverberation time and look at it over a full 60, uh, the K for 60 decibels, you come up with the same reverberation time as you had before measuring it in the nave. But if you look at the early part of the decay, it starts out decaying significantly more rapidly. And then eventually, so what's happening, something in the choir is early on absorbing a lot of the sound and causing the decay to be more rapid than that governed by the room as a whole. And we are pretty sure we know what that is. The woodwork in the chapel is just absolutely exquisite. Uh, and a lot of it is very heavy, solid wood. One place where it's not solid wood, however, is the paneling here at the rear of the choir stalls. That is a thin veneer on thin plywood. As a result, if people think wood is being resonant, but if you've got a surface of a room that's resonant, you're losing sound because if the surface vibrates, at best, it only re-radiates re half the sound back into the room, the other half's re re radiated the other way. And if it flexes, that means you're converting some of the energy into heat through friction. So sound is absorbed by large panels of anything if they can move in response to the sound. And we're confident that's what's happening. We looked at ways to remedy that, and we can't find an easy way. You'd have to beef up that paneling somehow, even by bracing it from behind. Or by replacing it with something thicker, 
And that was actually looked at some years ago. We could not find a Finnish carpenter who was willing to touch that wall <laughs> uh, because of the difficulty of taking it apart, putting it back together again, and preserving the, the visual beauty of it. So we're living with that for the time being. Uh, and, but, and it's a small thing, but it's one that was noticed by, by the professional organists and, and choral directors. Incidentally, Rodney Weinkoop, the director of, of choirs in the chapel, is choral music, uh, is, is a master at training choirs to perform works in that space and convey lyrics that lesser choirs could never do. I mean, to convey intricate lyrics in a space that reverberant is a real task, and it requires uh, at least over enunciation uh, and great <coughs> careful training of the choirs, and Rodney does a wonderful job of that. Here's a collection of uh, reverberation times for rooms at Duke, many of which you may have experienced. I thought it was fun to put this up. People oftentimes refer to a reverberation time as a single number. That's very misleading. Uh, in fact, reverberation time depends on frequency because the materials uh, absorb different amounts of energy, different frequencies. So here's Duke Chapel, the, the nave of Duke Chapel, the actual reverberation time. The green curve here is the early decay time for the chapel choir, which we were just discussing. And I should emphasize that's not a reverberation time. It is an early decay time. The reverberation time is just as high in the choir. It's just that the, psychologically, if the, the initial decay is more rapid, we psychologically interpret that as being a, a, a shorter uh, reverberation time. But some of the, the frequency dependence, there's some wonderful examples here about, so for instance, um, here uh, we've got, uh, oh, this, this is uh, the new uh, Goodson Chapel. Uh, this is uh, the Nelson Music Room, very, very fine room for, for uh, chamber music. Uh, and notice, it, talking about the importance of the frequency dependence, uh, the Nelson Room is much more reverberant uh, than is, um, what is this, uh, Vonder Hayden. Uh, at, at, uh, at, at, at mid frequencies, but at low frequencies, Vonder Hayden becomes very, very reverberant. Um, the, uh, that Vonder Hayden has been used for uh, chamber orchestra performances. Uh, and then down in, I'm sorry, what did I just do? I've lost my, uh, just lost it. Let me just regenerate it. Sorry, sorry about that. I, I'm using an unfamiliar mouse because it has a nice uh, scanning wheel on it, which I thought would be helpful. And I touched the wrong part of it. Um, So here we are with, with uh, you know, Reynolds, uh, Page, uh, Bone Hall, both with and without its sound absorbing drapes. All four you know, are very similar uh, ranges here. I put in one at the, at the bottom, which is sort of, I couldn't resist doing since we were gonna be having this uh, presentation here. Uh, this is the very low room. <laughs> Definitely the winner in terms of the low reverberation time. And it's actually much lower than that now because of your being here. Uh, so, Duke Chapel, our most reverberant space, uh, sort of peaks at about five and a half seconds. I know there's literature out there saying it goes to seven. I've never heard it that long. Uh, and a, another sort of uh, Goodson Chapel is, is down around, is, is always under three. I want to keep those two numbers in mind because we're going to look at some other uh, examples that uh, we want to relate to that. So now I'm going to go sort of the second topic. We'll carry over some of these concepts to these other examples. And this is a wonderful study done by two architectural historians, Deborah Howard and Laura Moretti uh, from Oxford and Cambridge <coughs> Universities. Uh, they were able to get a grant to take uh, a, the choir, that's the boy choir, the choral scholars, and the organ scholars from St. John's College, Cambridge, to Venice for a week and conduct a number of, of really interesting experiments. Uh, this is a, 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 a choir that's very well trained in choral polyphony in the 16th century, late 15th, early 16th century. And uh, they actually went in and also had some measurements made by acoustics laboratories, both in Venice and Cambridge. And they studied a number of churches, 11 churches in all, in Venice, uh, looking particularly at some of the musicological questions about where different choral groups would have been located within the churches to perform some of the emerging uh, choral poly polyphonic works. Uh, the first church to, to look at, of, of course, is San Marco, which today is a cathedral, but only became a cathedral in the 19th century. Uh, it's always been the Doge's Chapel. Uh, it was built in the 11th century. And typically these are not rooms built in the Renaissance. We refer to them as Renaissance Venetian churches. They were there in the Renaissance, but they were typically much older. And so the people were adapting to the acoustics of the buildings that they had as they were inventing the new styles of music. Uh, the reverberation time in, uh, in San Marco is uh, four, and a half, four to five seconds uh, with, an, with an early decay time that is as low as two seconds. So there are places in San Marco that are quite different. 
does not enjoy the nice, even distribution of reverberant characteristics that Duke Chapel does. But it's in the, at the maximum, it's in the same range. Here's an interior uh, which was very strongly influenced by uh, Hagia Sophia and its sister churches in Istanbul. Each of the cases I'm, I'm going to discuss here, where we have mic we have recordings, they were made with the microphone located where the ducal throne, where the doge would have sat, uh, which is here in St. Mark's, uh, because he was the only person who really mattered. If, if, <laughs> if you were the conductor uh, and you wanted to have the sound be good for the most important audience, it was it was the doge and the people right around him. Uh, so, so that's where we, we're pretty confident that that's, things would have been maximized for that. Just to give you some examples, uh, this is a, a Claudio Monteverdi, and I hope some of you got to hear the wonderful performance of Monteverdi Vespers recently over in, uh, in the chapel. Um, this is a recording of a, a work by Monteverdi, uh, uh, Salve Regina, um, from 1640, somewhat later in his career. He had been in Venice for that time for, for several decades. Uh, the Vesper was uh, composed shortly before he went to Vienna, and may have been his audition piece for Vienna, uh, for, not for Vienna, for Venice. Uh, this is an example where we have two tenors and the organ in a gallery at this location, and we're recording it from a microphone here where the Doge, would, the Doge's throne would have been. Very clear. piece by Adrian Willert, who was a very influential composer earlier time. This was composed in 1550, but he was the, uh, the Kapellmeister in, in, uh, in, in uh, the, was, was master of the, of the choral uh, uh, ensembles in St. Mark's uh, for quite a while and composed many of his most famous works. This is an example of a combination of a chant choir with a polyphony choir, uh, again listening from the position of the Doge's <coughs> throne. But with the chant choir in a traditional location where the monks might well have done their daily office, back behind the altar, uh, and but with the uh, polyphonic choir in a gallery right behind the doge, just over his shoulder. Let's see the chant choir. Of that. that has a, I think, a very nice uh, sort of evocative aspect of having the chant choir with the reverberation and then a very clear polyphonic choir closer by. But you could also put the chant choir in the opposite gallery, um, opposite, uh, top the opposite pergola, uh, pergola. and uh, so you have the, the chant choir on one side and the polyphonic choir on the other, and that makes the chant choir much clearer. aspects of San Marco is that there are three pulpits. There's a double pulpit here on this side and a very large octagonal pulpit on this side. The Doge's throne would have typically been there. At one time the Doge's throne was actually in this pulpit, uh, but they had a Doge with a really severe case of the gout and he ended that tradition. Yeah. Um, so the, the Doge would, would sit, uh, the period would be interested, would, uh, almost certainly would have been sitting in this region over here and just inside the chancel. 
Uh, but there are some interesting uh, pieces of artwork showing a choir crammed into this large <laughs> pulpit, uh, this large lecture uh, called the, uh, the Gonzo. And uh, so the, the, the choir really to try by this. And so this is a recording from the Doge's seat of a choir singing uh, a wonderful Gabrielli piece, uh, Giovanni Gabrielli piece, called uh, Timor e Tremor, or Fear and Trembling, which is a wonderful piece of dramatic writing from this from 1615. It's just it's really, really evocative of, of fear and trembling, and I couldn't resist playing it. <laughs> show you a, a, a very different church, uh, a much larger one. This is one of the Benedictine churches in the vicinity uh, with a reverberation time of seven and a half seconds mm -hmm. and an early decay time that's uh, is, is, is at, at le least uh, five seconds. Uh, this is a 16th century church. Uh, the architect was Andrea Palladio, mm -hmm. a very famous church and very large church, very different kind of acoustical conditions. This is of interest with re relation to the Doge as well because the Doge would routinely visit uh, many of the churches in Venice on particular days during the year, particular Saints' Day, for instance, and the Doge would set uh, out on on, the, on barges uh, from Sa uh, San Marco, uh, from his palace, to go to this, these churches he was visiting, and he would take with him the choirs of San Marco, typically, and of course the choirs of the place he was visiting would want to show their stuff as well. So everybody would have been competing for the for the Doge's ear, these locations. This is a particularly interesting church uh, in various aspects of it. This is viewing from just inside the entrance here, looking back, and you can see this colonnade that's located there. There's now an organ uh, above that. This is looking from that arcade in the same direction, and there is a retro choir, a large space where the monks of the, the, Benedict, the Benedictine monks would have held their daily office. Uh, so there's, that's really, in some sense, a, a slightly different space. Uh, this is the view of the, uh, of the choral lectern in that space. Uh, with the choir stalls all around it, looking back toward the main space of the nave. So this is where that organ was that we saw earlier. So here's the floor plan of it. First, let's listen to what the, uh, the monk's daily office would have sounded like with the microphone actually located in the retro choir um, uh, uh, where, the, uh, where the chorus is, is assembled around the electric. congregation. Let's put our microphone here at between the transepts and the and the, uh, the, and the well what, what sometimes function is choir of the church but the, the Ceremonial occasion, 
Uh, one choice would be to put him right under the single dome of this church, a uh, visually central location, in which case you might want to arrange a choir in one of these little uh, side chapels. Uh, this would give you sort of a focusing effect and should provide uh, a lot of, of early direct sound to provide some clarity, even though, of course, you're going to have this extremely long seven and a half second reverberation time to contend with as well. Let's listen. This is another Giovanni Gabrielli piece, Jubilati uh, Deo. Listen, listen to a little of that. So because the, the day on which the Doge was visiting this church typically uh, would have been the same day of the saint whose altar was located here in this side chapel. <laughs> so what would it sound like if we put the Doge's throne there, which would be a, liturgically appropriate in terms of the occasion, uh, but keep our choir over here? Would that work? Do we actually get good early communication across this space because of the focusing effect here? Well, in fact, it's pretty darn good. historians and people working with them uh, combine not only these recordings but also uh, questionnaires from a jury of listeners who were sitting in various locations in the spaces and also very careful acoustical measurements uh, using multi-directional loudspeakers where the crowd choirs were located and making uh, de detailed statistical analyses of the kind we'll be talking about in a couple of minutes uh, of these spaces and so one of the hopes is that by taking these recordings with those measurements will get to be a lot better at predicting, rather than having to actually go with a well-trained choir and try these things out, we'll get to be much better at predicting what things would sound like. And I'm going to give you a little bit of taste of what the potential for that is uh, at the end of the talk today. I want to show you one more church, just uh, at the opposite end of the scale, something much smaller than uh, San Marco. This is uh, San Michel in, in Isola, uh, Camel de Leze uh, Monastery, uh, 15th century church. Uh, uh, the design was by Mario Cadusi. Uh, and this is said to have strongly influenced uh, the, the, uh, the, the later the church we just watched, uh, the one we just saw in terms of architecture, the Palladio church. Uh, unfortunately, we were able to make acoustic measurements in this one. There were a lot of politics involved. If you ever worked with uh, the church bureaucracy in, in Italy, you may know that it's very difficult to make arrangements. And so they were not able to exclude tourists from any of these spaces when making the recordings, for instance. So you'll hear high heels flipping by from time to time. Um, but uh, and, and in this case, they weren't even able to negotiate uh, some time to make acoustic measurements. This is, I, this is particularly interesting. Notice the window here, as we'll see from the other side. Here's that window on the inside. This had, um, had a, a smaller group of monks chanting their daily office. And they're actually located on a balcony here, sort of in the middle of the, uh, of the, the, the nave of, this, of the church. Here it is from the other side, from the doorway side, uh, enclosed in wood and with two layers of choir stalls. Here are the voice from the, uh, from the men and voice from St. John uh, sitting in this choir. And it's, it's really very, very nice, the sound that you get, not only for the monks themselves, but in this case, the, the monks chanting from an elevated position here in, this, in these stalls, uh, picked up out in the, na in the native, is really quite, uh, quite clear and quite nice. discovered that uh, if you put all of the, all of this, the chant choir in the upper row of the choir songs, it was even clearer. I won't take the time to play that out, but 
Now here, here you see them all, all stuffed into the upper wall. That's actually a little bit clearer because of the angles involved in having them distributed on both ways. And they also experimented with the choir up actually in the chancel uh, and with the microphone in the nave. I won't play that for you just for interest of time. They experimented with that and they also did an experiment with, uh, the lo with one of the local priests uh, to, of, of, that, uh, of, of, the, of the order. Um, actually speaking a text uh, from the chancel, and uh, this is a small enough church, the reverberation time is low enough, even though it wasn't measured, that, that you can understand the speech. This is a text in Italian, not in Latin. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to change gears one more time <laughs> to the 19th century in Berlin. Uh, there was a wonderful presentation made here. Here, I'm sorry to talk over the text. But, uh, there was a wonderful presentation made here last March by uh, Larry Todd, uh, by uh, Penelope Jensen, soprano. Uh, Professor Todd is, is the expert on the, the music and life of Felix Mendelssohn and had become interested also in Felix's uh, older sister, Fanny Mendelssohn Hensel. Uh, who was also a very, very fine musician. There's even some debate as to who was the better musician in childhood. Um, and because of her social status, uh, their father would not permit her to have a public career. She could not perform in public because you know, women of leisure just did not do that in that time in Berlin society. Um, but they did provide for her a concert hall in their mansion in Berlin. Uh, and uh, she, even though there were technically not public performances, she would invite large audiences to come in for these Sunday afternoon musicales where her works were performed. And she composed hundreds of works, was a very, very accomplished composer uh, who until very recently had not received the recognition which is due. And uh, Professor Todd has, uh, in, in accompanying his wonderful biography of, of Felix Mendelssohn, has a, a book of, about Fani, which was published last year, and I commend that to you. Uh, and some of the illustrations and examples are, of th this, what I'm saying would not be possible without his scholarship on this. Um, it's, it's very easy to find uh, the location of their house on a map of, of uh, Berlin uh, because you have this uh, very distinctive octagonal uh, square, uh, which eventually became Leipziger, uh, became Potsdamer, Leipziger Platz. It's just inside the Potsdamer Gate um, and just inside the wall. This is actually very close to where the Berlin Wall was uh, until recently. Uh, and Leipziger Strasse Drei, number three Leipziger Strasse, is where their mansion was located. Uh, this was a, a royal porcelain factory, and this was a, a, a <coughs> residence of a prince, and they shared a, a back garden with some of the prince's gardens. This is 1798, which would have been about the time that uh, their mansion was initially being constructed. They purchased it in the 1820s, uh, and this, here's a map of uh, the, the region in 1836. Again, theirs being a private residence, it's not shown on the map, but the, uh, the, the state and, and the princely residences are shown on here, uh, that the state uh, porcelain factory is shown. But there, again, Leipzig Strasse Dry would, would be right here. We have a photograph from the late 19th century of the facade of that building. Very, very impressive mansion, 55 meters wide. Uh, this was a pass-through where carriages could drive through to the courtyard that was surrounded by the mansion. Uh, this, as I say, was 1897, so there are uh, the, the, you know, the gas lights are, are modern compared to what was there when the Mendelssohns were there. The Mendelssohns sold the, the uh, uh, not too long after the death of Fani and Felix, um, the Mendelssohns sold the property to the Prussian government who turned it into one of the houses of parliament, the Prussian parliament. Uh, and one of the first things they did was to tear down the rear wing that contained this concert hall in order to produce offices uh, there. We have the architectural plans uh, from about the time that the Mendelssohns purchased the property. Uh, so this is the, the street facade is uh, is down here, and uh, this the, the pass through for, for for carriages is will come in this way and turn that corner. So carriages would be parked in this courtyard during performances. Uh, th this is the garden saal, the room that was dedicated as a performance space for Fanny Hensel, uh, and. Uh, just to orient you, uh, the, the gardens were back here, both their gardens and the, which connected to the much larger gardens of, of a prince. Uh, the, there were two porches, uh, one, one out to the gardens, and the doorways on that side uh, had uh, glass in them. There were glass doorways that could be opened uh, in good weather to allow an audience to spill out of that porch. 
There was also a porch on this side, but with all the carriages being parked there for a performance, uh, people may have come in that way for a performance, uh, but the doors would have certainly been kept firmly closed all during a performance uh, because of the noise from the, the horses uh, and carriages fidgeting around in the courtyard. This was funny, Hensel's um, uh, uh, studio where she would uh, practice. We'll see if we do have a nice image of that. Uh, this space was eventually converted to be an art studio for her husband. Uh, she married uh, a court painter, uh, uh, Wilhelm Hensel, and this was converted to the family with a nice uh, southern light exposure for uh, northern light exposure for his uh, art studio. And uh, oh, this is the ground floor plan, but above, one floor above this, in this location is where Felix's room was a boy. Um, and I mentioned that because uh, Felix actually did a drawing, he did a number of very fine drawings uh, and, and watercolors. Uh, this is a view of the inner courtyard, this is that inner porch of the concert hall. And, and uh, in his drawing from his bedroom window, uh, you see that this doorway is exactly centered between the first two columns. And this is the kind of check that we look at. We always want to know how reliable the drawings we have, the various representations we have are. And that one is very encouraging, because if you go through that window uh, between those columns to that doorway, it is exactly centered. So this gives us a lot of confidence all the way around, just sort of confirming evidence. Another of Felix's drawings, and this is not a very good reproduction of it, I apologize, but it's actually from the garden side that shows the garden saal, the concert space, uh, with an awning that they had over it. But we can see here that they've relocated the steps. We can see this in another picture. This is an, another one done by, uh, um, uh, by Sebastian Hensel, who was uh, Fanny's son. Uh, you, you can see that the steps were relocated uh, on that porch, that initially they had been off center here, and they've now been centered just on the center bay of that porch. Uh, and, and there's a suggestion here that maybe the porch was widened a little bit. It's ambiguous. Uh, it's hard, if that does come out here, it's hard to understand what the rest of these steps do, because this one seems to end right against that face. But um, it may be that they slightly widened this porch, or at least the center part of it, uh, when they moved the steps. And that's an important consideration because of some claims that, uh, that Sebastian Hensel made in some writings that he left about the size of the space. Here's a watercolor view, a black and white version of a color watercolor of uh, Fun Money's uh, studio. Uh, we see wooden floors, which is an important consideration because one of our real questions is to whether the floors in the garden saw were wooden or something harder and more reflective than that. We also get a sense of her decorating uh, uh, tastes uh, with lots of paintings located around the walls that would have provided some uh, high frequency uh, diffuse reflections, which would be helpful. Because what we want to try to do is to recreate that uh, garden saw room electronically. We also had some drawings that were made when the modification was done for, for Wilhelm Hensel's studio, and that fortunately includes a really nice section of the garden wing. So we know what the, uh, the dimensions, the vertical dimensions of that room were. We know that the ceilings could not have been high as, uh, as, as Sebastian uh, claimed they were. Uh, and uh, we, we, guess we, we know the maximum height of the cupola that we know is in that room. We don't, this doesn't show the cupola, but it gives us, because we know the structure, we know how tall that cupola might have been at a maximum. So here are the beginnings of our computer model of that room, that room which hasn't existed since the mid-19th century, but a room of great interest musicologically because it's the room for which Fanny Hensel composed uh, her music. Um, we looked at the number of seats. If the room is closed, closed up, uh, this is just a, a modern array of seats in the model uh, that would have a maximum of 60 seats, allowing some space for the performers in that case. And if we open the doors on a nice day, uh, put the piano along the long wall, and let people sit on the porch, again, using this, the size of the porch that we're confident of, but not an extension, we only get uh, 70 seats. So Sebastian's enthusiastic uh, report that hundreds of people attended uh, is, is probably <laughs> exaggerated. And even if you think of people who are spilling out into the garden, uh, they would have been at a substantially lower level. Remember, they're three steps down. So it would certainly not have been ideal listening conditions. Um, Here's a, a perspective view of our model. Uh, we saw some gas lights uh, all around the walls. And this piano is, is actually, uh, we, we did some measurements of the Muzio Clementi piano that's in the Duke University Musical Instrument Collection. Uh, and, and that has a direct, is a direct uh, connection, if you will, to Fanny Mendelssohn. Because I understand this, Larry, correct me if I got it wrong. But I think that Muzio Clementi, the founder of that firm, was the teacher of a teacher of both Fanny and Felix. Is that right, Larry? Um, 
And so there's a, a connection from there. So we couldn't resist putting uh, the Muccio Clemente piano into our model room. Here's another perspective view. This is from the other side. This is, this is from the garden side. You can see the columns on the garden porch. This is from the other side uh, with, with the, making the walls, intervening walls transparent. And we also just took a photograph of Duke Gardens and suspended it outside the model so that as you look out through the doors, you can actually see something that would, that's suggesting that the gardens that they would have had. So here is a view from inside that room uh, looking out. Now, the only light is, from the, uh, is from coming in from the outside and from the, uh, the gas lights in here. We have a chandelier suspended in the, uh, in the cupola, which is the maximum size we think it could have been. Uh, and again, our, our Mucio Clemente piano. And another view of the same sort. Now, here's a, a model that we actually did some calculations with and produced some and, and processed some music with. Well, we put the piano down at the short end of the room um, so we can, we can have the doors either open or closed. It's you know, reasonable to assume either way. And uh, we chose a location for the source of the sound. We used a recording that had been made here last March of Penny Jensen singing uh, with Larry Todd playing the piano, that Muccio Clemente piano. Uh, we have a recording of a, of a little 50-second uh, excerpt from that performance. And we're locating the source of that here. This shows a loudspeaker. It's directional. It's not actually directional. We've used uh, a, a source that reproduces the characteristics of a female, of a soprano voice and a piano. And we chose a seat. So we chose this particular seat as the location. So what you're going to hear is an attempt to recreate what that piano and that vocalist would, sound, would have sounded like in that room heard from this location in the room. Here's a picture, uh, a perspective view from that seat, so sort of looking toward the piano, uh, with you know, clearly no other people in the audience. Uh, I don't want to take any time on this, but here are reverberation times under various assumptions for that room. Uh, if you have a hard floor rather than a wooden floor, uh, it really makes a difference in the reverberation time. This is up uh, close to four seconds, more reverberant than Vincent Chapel, for instance, uh, with no one present. Uh, if you have a wooden floor, uh, that has a dramatic effect on, on the reverberation time, again, with the doors closed. So we, we think this, it, you know, it, it's, it's a, an interesting argument as to whether, given the purposes of that room, being a garden saw, it was an open space between the courtyard and the external garden, whether they would have had a wooden floor there or whether they would have wanted something more durable, bring in large potted palms and so forth in the winter, uh, various things of that sort. But it's a, acoustically a large difference. Uh, we, we, we also looked at, uh, at, at what the effect of putting carpet into the room would have been. Uh, we also looked at uh, the effect of opening the doors uh, would have had. Uh, this is all without an audience present, and so I'm just going to move on to some of the uh, to our simulations, which include an audience. So we have a recording of a, of a bit of one verse from a song by Fannie Mendelssohn Hensel, uh, performed here on uh, March 19, 2010, by Larry Todd, the piano, Penelope Jensen, soprano, uh, using the Muccio Clemente piano. Uh, this was a recording done by Vocal, a wonderful recording, and this room is dead enough that this recording is great for our purposes. In principle, we'd like to have an anechoic recording with no reverberation at all. This is close to it. Uh, and it's been processed by using software uh, that uh, Professor Honor in Berlin, interesting coincidence, uh, has given us uh, academic license for which, is, for which we're grateful. Here's the text of the song, a translation of the text of the song, and I'm, I can play some examples for you. First, let me just play the raw recording. As it was, the, this is the starting point of our calculation the recording as it was made in this room last uh, early in the year. in the room. Uh, we had, did have some, a few paintings on the wall. Actually, I tried to, you may have noticed those paintings in, the, uh, in one of the visions I showed, visions I showed you. Uh, we actually, as a, as a little bit of a conceit, actually put a portrait of Moses Mendelssohn in one of those. But it doesn't show up in the gaslight, so we, we, we'd have to make it uh, phosphorescent or something to see it in these, these images. Um, but this is with a hard floor, with the doors closed, with no audience present and no furnishings present. 
the most reverberant case. You can imagine this being perhaps a rehearsal uh, condition. <laughs> Incidentally, this, is, this modeling has been a project of a, of a freshman seminar that I've been teaching this semester. Uh, that seminar was meeting in the, in, in the room right here, Flowers Room, right before this session. And so a number of, there's been discussion in the class of various options of some, some of the things modeled here, here. And there are other possibilities we're interested in looking at in the future. For instance, what if we eliminate the cupola? How much difference does that make in the sound of the room? Because we're not sure of the dimensions of the cupola, but I mean, sort of the maximum size. Uh, we, we see the effect of adding upholstered chairs, and we feel certain that the Mendelssohn family would have provided upholstered chairs for their guests. Uh, we can also look at the addition of an audience. So sort of the, the minimum reverberation case would be with an, a full audience present, a, a sizable audience, and with the doors open, and I'll end with that. <laughs> sit in the third column on the right, okay, back from the crossing. Uh, now, an interesting thing that happens there is because the addition of addition, additional people reduce the reverberation in the chapel. So if you have, there, there's a very individualistic judgment as to how, what ratio you want to have between the direct sound, the early sound, and the reverberation. And that's a personal matter of personal taste. But whatever your decision about that is, 
the, the seat at which you'll find that will be further from the organ, from, from the flint rock, the larger the audience is. Okay? So you want to sit more, more if there's a very large audience, sit more to the front in order to get the same sort of balance. Because the, the reverberant sound in that room is amazingly uniform for reasons we discussed briefly, uh, the, all the diffusive scattering. But the direct sound, the early sound, the sound arriving within the association time that carries a lot of the, the rhythmic structure uh, is very variable. And so the ratio between the two is something that's under your control deciding where to sit. Yes. What is the, uh, the rationale for the desirability of that linear decay uh, of the reverberation? Smoothness and uniformity. Uh, so you're not, here. I'm sorry? How does that affect the ear of the listener? Well, it, people generally tend to find a smooth decay that's the same at all. You, well, let me give you some examples of things, departures from that. Uh, if you were to have a more rapid decay in some frequency ranges than in others, then the character as the sound decay, the reverberant sound decay after the cessation of a chord, say, would actually change its character because the spectral balance would change. That's generally undesirable. And so that goes along with the smoothness of the decay. Uh, and, and plus the fact that if you, have, if you don't have an absolutely smooth decay, you're going to hear it as being a shorter decay than in fact it is. You're going to hear the, the, the steepest decay is, what you will, is the psychological impression you'll get. So the, it's the, the best design is to maximize the diffusive scattering at all frequencies and, and try to achieve an absolutely uniform uh, decay, in time, uniform in time and also across the frequency spectrum. I didn't show plus, but for Duke Chapel in, in the nave, you get exactly that same beautiful straight decay. And they, that was an individual measurement for a single gunshot, which you don't normally even try to measure. You, you average several in order to get a reasonable curve. Uh, but you can do any one uh, impulse in the chapel and get a beautiful straight uh, decay, logarithmically straight decay. I gather that the uh, reverberation time of the chapel as it was originally built was better suited to the aeolian organ that was in there. Well, and what did they do when they renovated it recently to accommodate that? The, yeah, that, the, there are several excellent uh, points in that. Uh, one is that, yes, it was, it was, of course, it was ideally suited to, to, to intelligibility of speech. I mean, this was a Methodist church, and uh, <laughs> sermons are important. Um, and so it was, it was fortunate that it was only increased when the technology existed to, 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 uh, to restore that. Uh, but the original Aeolian was not voiced on site. That was not the practice of the Aeolian company. It was voiced in Chicago, it was built, and it was just delivered and installed. Uh, when the organ was extensively renovated recently, however, a lot of thought was given to matching it to the, to the chapel. Some additional stops were added, and, uh, and many of the uh, ranks of pipes were, uh, were, were revoiced. And our uh, masterful uh, uh, curator of organs and harpsichords here at, 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 at uh, Duke uh, does continuously works on all the organs, makes adjustments. He has a very fine ear. He's an accomplished organist himself, organ build, builder. Uh, but he makes adjustments. John Santoyani is his name. Uh, he makes adjustments as well uh, based on his careful listening uh, for rehearsals and performances. And so uh, and it's a very different kind of organ. The, the kind of, of liturgical use that uh, these electromechanical instruments uh, or electro-pneumatic instruments uh, have uh, where you have, in, in many cases, a lot of the, the pipes are boxed off in separate rooms and the sound sort of leaks from those spaces into the room. That was used to great effect by particularly 19th and early 20th century composers to have these sort of ethereal, uh, you know, distant, uh, mysterious kind of sounds, particularly for sequence music in Anglican church liturgy. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a very effective uh, instrument uh, for a particular. And Duke Chapel is unique in this country, to my knowledge, of having the flintrop uh, for the, you know, Bach and, and uh, and, and you have the, uh, the Aeolian for the 19th, early 20th century literature, and then the most recent edition is, is the, uh, the uh, um, I'm blanking on the name. Uh, uh, the Brombao, uh, uh, produced by uh, John Brombao, <laughs> Eugene Oregon, uh, which is, is, is modeled on, not, not copy, but it's modeled on early, uh, uh, early organs from Tuscany uh, with, with a lot of the features of those organs with a few additional stops of, of, of German style solo, solo ranks, uh, and, and is tuned in quarter comma mean tone, not in equal temperament. Uh, which is an important part of our, of our educational uh, offerings here at Duke, to be able to experience many of these works in quarter comma mean tone, uh, where certain intervals sound excruciatingly bad, much worse than <laughs> equal temperament, but other intervals sound just wonderfully better than they can ever sound with equal temperament. 
and just be able to develop the sensitivity of your ear to appreciate the difference. We're so jaded because so much of what we hear is an equal temperament. Uh, just to be able to go in there and listen to things, things performed on the, uh, on the, the, the uh, on that organ, on the rhombal, is, is an opportunity to educate your ear to, to appreciate the benefits of, of non-equal temperaments. I think, unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. And if you have more questions about the organ, one of our speakers next semester is actually Jack Johnson Toyani. So do watch for his. He'll be here in March. But I really want to thank you so much, Judy. This was a fantastic um, talk. I learned so much. So um, if you have more questions, we have a reception out in the lobby as usual. Thank you very, very much.